My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm ProPublica's Interim Director of Communications. Welcome to Race, Power, Race, Police, and Power in Small Town America. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. In 2018, we started the Local Reporting Network to support local and regional newsrooms as they work on important investigative projects affecting their communities. In 2020, we, start, we partnered with the News and Observer to investigate the battle for racial justice in Graham, North Carolina, a small town with a long history of racial violence and aggressive policing and restrictive laws around protesting. For this event, ProPublica and the News and Observer have convened the two lead reporters from the story, local activists, and a historian for a timely discussion on race and policing. We also invited Alamance County Sheriff Terry Johnson, who declined, and Graham Police Chief Christy Cole, who did not respond. Now to introduce our speakers. Don Blagrove is an attorney and executive director of Emancipate North Carolina, a nonprofit focused on dismantling structural racism and mass incarceration that has, among other things, organized legal defense for Black Lives Matter protesters across the state. Scott Nelson is a professor of history at the University of Georgia. He is an award-winning author who has written about Alamance County during Reconstruction, including in the book, Iron Confederacies. Ebony Pinnix grew up in Alamance County and was involved in Black Lives Matter activism there throughout 2020. She has also worked in healthcare and public health outreach. Julia Wall is a visual journalist at the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she creates both daily and long form content for online and print. Thank you to our panel for joining today. Also, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who registered. If you'd like to ask a question, you can click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. Our moderator today is Carly Brousseau. Carly is an investigative reporter at the News and Observer. Thanks again for joining us and thanks to McKinsey and Company for supporting this event. I'll let Carly take it from here. Thanks, Connor, for the introductions. Um, I also want to thank ProPublica, which made this event and the reporting we'll be talking about possible. The News and Observer was part of ProPublica's local reporting network last year, and that meant that I was able to devote all my time to Alamance County and also draw on other resources from ProPublica's newsroom. T. Christian Miller was my editor and guide, and lots of other people had a hand in the project. A little background on the journalism that brought us here. After a Minneapolis police officer killed George Floyd, setting off protests across the country, I decided to revisit the Department of Justice lawsuit against Terry Johnson, the sheriff of Alamance County. Some years back, he'd been accused of some of the country's worst racial profiling. And I wondered about the lawsuit's legacy. What, if anything, had changed? And what might that mean for the public debate about police accountability in small Southern towns? Deep in the legal file, a government lawyer asked Sheriff Johnson, have you ever in your life attended a meeting of the Ku Klux Klan? Sheriff Johnson answered, no, sir. Well, I'll take that back. Yes, I have. Um, I was in the Greensboro Klan Nazi shootout as an SBI agent. I've done surveillance at Klan's meeting. And then the page cut off and the next one was missing. And that sent me on a journey trying to connect the past to the present. So I'm really excited to have all of you here for this discussion um, so we can continue to make those connections together. And um, Ebony, I'd like to start with you. Um, given that you grew up in Alamance County, what was that like and how has your perception of the place and the people changed over time? So um, I guess growing up in Alamance County was kind of weird because when I was younger, we kind of ignored the fact that racism even existed. Because as a child, you have friends of all color. And as far as you know, they love you for who you are. You don't know any difference. But as you started getting older, you notice where they're starting to act funny. Um, I would say the major point in my life where I realized that racism was real and it was an issue right here in Alamance County was one of my best friends in high school. She invited me to her house, but she had to tell me how to act in her house first because her mom was okay, but her stepdad was definitely racist. Her stepdad is also brothers of one of, I guess you could say one of the wealthiest men in Alamance 
county that owns a lot of stuff that we all support. We've all bought stuff from them. We've all did different things. So anyway, um, I went to her house and it was like, we're going in the bedroom and don't come out and he won't bother us. And I'm like, well, she's my friend. And she said, I'm safe, she's safe. And I was, she kept me safe. But I noticed that I would hear the mama and the stepfather arguing a lot. And she was like, well, we're going to go outside and back. And as we moved towards the back, it, the argument kind of gravitated towards that way too. So that was the first time, I think I was like 15 or 16, that I realized that, okay, I can't ignore it anymore because it just slapped me in the face. I can't be friends with her anymore because it's causing a wedge in her household. Um, so that was basically the first time that I opened my eyes and said, this is not a thing that you just see on the movie. Um, it, it, it's not dead. Slavery is not that far from where we are today. Um, it's still here, and that that was that was a big wake up call because I looked at everybody. Else. How did you start to connect that experience with policing, or what brought you into the streets? Can you talk about that connection? Well, the connection for me was I have children that are young adults. Um, one is at Wisconsin State, and I have. Um, one that's out on his own and I can no longer protect them. I cannot protect them physically because they're not in my home. Um, the only other way I felt I could protect them was to actually get out here and start fighting, start trying to be part of the solution instead of the problem because by not doing anything, I'm part of the problem also. So I had to start because I hadn't really been educating them on racism either because I felt like if you just stay in your lane, they'll stay in theirs, and we never cross lanes, we don't have to worry about anything, because that's how I grew up. But then, I mean, just realizing, hey, you remember your best friend, and how that worked out, like, let's go ahead and do something about it. So that's what ended me in Graham last year. It was time to stop sitting on the couch and acting like it don't exist, because I will say, because I can't protect my kids. That was the big thing for me. Don, does this resonate with you and what you hear from other protesters across the state? Yes. Yes, it absolutely does resonate with me. And um, uh, I just need a minute because so very often we glaze over the trauma um, that racism causes to Black people in America and especially to our children. There is this pre-juxtaposition that we that our children and that black people should just be able to absorb these tra traumatic experiences and should never and are and never have the space or the audacity to think that we should be able to discuss the trauma of those events and and and, and acknowledge how hurtful they are and how they create create generational trauma. So sorry, I just needed a minute to to uh, to sit in that, but. Um, yeah, these are very similar stories that we hear all over the South, the South particularly, but especially um, as it relates to Black folks who are born and raised in the South, um, there is just a certain, certain unspoken set of norms that relate to how you interact with white people in your community and how your age absolutely determines what the rules are right? Because what Ebony talked to us about was that once she hit about 15 or 16, this girl had been her best friend. But once she hit about the age where she was coming into her womanhood, then how she was perceived by the folks around her changed. Um, and that is a reality that, that people deal with all over the state of North Carolina. And yes, I have children. I have two daughters myself. Um, that is what what drives me to do this work. And that is what drives most of us to do this work is that we do not want our children to have to fight and validate their humanity the way that we have to do over and over again. So yes, what Ebony is saying to you is absolutely um, commiserate with what I hear statewide and nationally, to be perfectly honest, from people who have decided that now is the moment, especially in the wake of, of George Floyd, uh, that now is the moment to become active. Now is the moment to say, I will no longer accept second-class citizenry. You mentioned 
intergenerational trauma, which sort of brings us to the idea of, of history. And I mean, that's, I think, um, in many ways, a shared across geography, but also can be specific to geography. And um, I'd like to turn to Scott for a little um, of his work on, on the history of Alamance County. I know that, um, Scott, you've done a lot of work about Wyatt Outlaw, and that's a name I heard a lot in the streets, um, in Ebony's mouth and, and many others um, when Julia and I were out there. So could you um, tell us about Wyatt Outlaw and, and how you see that story kind of translating forward? Uh, yeah, the Wyatt Outlaw was, uh, to use Don's phrase, uh, the kind of peak of audacity, right? He he was somebody who pushed back against all of these ideas about what was acceptable for a black man to do, right? So he's in the US colored troops, it's called in the Union Army. Um, and he fights, you know, uh, alongside white soldiers against the Confederacy. He returns to Alamance County and he's the town constable. Um, he organizes a group called the Loyal Republican League of uh, uh, black men to, and men are only the ones voting at this time at, at, to get them to, to think about voting and think about their citizenship and take pride in themselves and who they are. And, and he creates a kind of peace. He's, he's friendly with both, uh, he's biracial and he's friendly with both black and white folks in Alamance. And the powers that be like Ebony is talking about uh, are not happy with this. And so they, they organize the Klan and they, they attack him once in 1869 and, uh, and then again in February of 1870 where they, where they hang him, where they kill him, where they, where they beat him up in front of his six-year-old son and his mother and drag him to an elm tree and hang him in the center of, uh, of, of Graham. And so that the, the sort of heroism that took to, to do all that, to stand up for everybody in that community, um, but particularly black people in that community, it was, was amazing. And, and it's, he paid the uh, highest price for, for that audacity and uh, recalling that, that not just his death, but the audacity to sort of stand up and fight is I think what's ex exciting about the story of White Outlaw. Ebony, what did you think when you first hear that, heard that story? When I first heard the story, um, first of all, it was heartbreaking that I, it was the first time I heard it. Um, to be someone Black and from Alamance County and know nothing about yourself, it's kind of crazy. Um, but when I first heard it, it was just, I don't know, I, we've always been here and for there not to be any classes or anything in the history book when we go to school to learn about this stuff right here in our own county, it was mind blowing. I mean, Julia, you've covered protests in a lot of places. It seemed to me with less experience than, than you have that the history was coming up more often. Like what, what did you observe? What jumped out at you about the experience of being at protests um, in this place compared to others? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the big difference is this very localized narrative and, and collective history that had been ignored for, for so long and people um, coming together in order to have their voices heard and then perpetually still being ignored by people within the community, by people in the local government, by people in law enforcement, that the reasons that they were there weren't really being heard and Wyatt Outlaw's story was a part of that. Although it, it became um, more popular within, within um, the, the groups of people who were, who were showing up to these protests, it was different from other places um, because there was a, such a stake in, in resurrecting this story for people who live there and grew up there. And like Ebony said, like being able to learn this story for the first time was a, a very intense experience. And more and more people were, were learning about that in these, at these protests. Um, and then, you know, kind of as the dust settled per se uh, in, in the winter, there would be more focused um, uh, events through groups like Occupy Graham, where they had a whole night dedicated to Wyatt Outlaw and they had made pamphlets about him. Um, so it was just a a much different um, 
takeaway and kind of concrete thing that came out of these these events rather than um, events taking place in Durham or in Raleigh that uh, were you know are bigger cities and there have maybe bigger crowds but this story kind of tied everybody together to this place and even people who weren't from Alamance County who were coming in to um, to attend these events were learning more about it and just kind of perpetuates the the story and and it brings it out to more people than I think have had ever heard it maybe. Don, I can see your comment about um, this kind of history, the story of white outlaw being intentionally suppressed and that being part of systemic racism. Can you expand on that? Um, I just think that it's so important that, and I hear Ebony saying, and, and, and it's a part of living in a system and in a country that is so oppressive to us that we internalize so much of of their oppression as if it is ours and that it is ours to own and it is not. Um, it is not your fault that you don't know who Outlaw was or you didn't know who he was because it is intentionally suppressed from us because the people who have power understand that it is in their benefit. It is the benefit of upholding white supremacy. It is in the benefit of upholding um, systemic and institutional racism that they do not tell an accurate depiction of the history and the role that black folks played in that history, and especially in places like Alamance County, right? Um, and, and which is ironic because uh, as we talk, as we move to talk about these Confederate statues, these folks are so, so deeply rooted and committed to history, to preserving history, uh, right? Uh, as they, uh, if you let them tell it, uh, but we can't be gaslit by these um, non-racial, uh, non-racial uh, excuses for sanitizing racism and hatred, because that's really what this is. Um, and I think that, but again, it is not ours to own, that it is not our fault that we don't know these things. You know, I do trainings all over the state about the roles of district attorneys and judges and sheriffs. And people will say to me who are who have been politically active their entire lives, um, I'm embarrassed that I don't know these things. And I say, oh no, don't be embarrassed because the power of the system, part of the way the system holds on to its power is to obfuscate this information. There is a very, a very intentional and a very intentional and deliberate exclusion of our stories from American history. And it is American history. It's just not the American history that they wanna talk about. Scott, I know you were really taken by one of the signs that, um, that I think Julia also recorded at some of the protests in Alamance County, especially late last year that said Google White Outlaw. Um, I'd love to hear you talk about that. And also, you know, how in, in your work you found that this um, story or the, the broader history of kind of um, what White Outlaw was doing and, and his, his fellow, um, the people he was working with in Alamance County, what they were trying to achieve and did achieve, how that story kind of got um, vanquished, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's the in fact, the, just as Don saying that, that there was a tree, right, where he was hanged and people knew where that tree was in the 1880s and in the 1890s, and then the tree fell down. And what did they replace the tree with but a statue of a Confederate soldier who wasn't there, right? Right. The man who stood to defend Graham, right, was out was wide outlaw. He he stood to defend the town against these Klansmen and when his memory goes away from the people who remember it, it's replaced by, uh, you know, a marble Confederate soldier. It's it's a, it's a, it's a horrible thing. And what Outlaw wanted to do was to create uh, a a kind of multiracial democracy. That was that was what he saw. He he made friendships. He was a carpenter, and uh, he made coffins. But he also made uh, he, he built the house that he was in. And he did a lot of building for the North Carolina Railroad. And he wanted to create this, this multiracial democracy at that time headed by the Republican Party, um, the party of Lincoln. And in which black and white folks stood together. Um, and when he was killed, the governor Holden at the time overreacted um, in, this, in the sense that he sent in troops 
uh, and that was it was the right reaction to send in troops and to capture these people. But the result was that people that uh, white people got scared when they sent in troops after uh, the people who hanged white outlaw, and it broke apart that democracy people, it, it drove pe white people into the Democratic Party, the party of the Klansmen, the party of the old Confederacy and helped crack apart uh, that multiracial democracy, that very brief multiracial democracy in, the, in North Carolina from 1865 until, until 1870. And, and when it broke in North Carolina, it broke in the rest of the South. That was, this is the center of Alamance, right? Which is in the center of North Carolina, which is in the center of the South. Out, he he stood by and kind of built helped build that that coalition, and when they killed him, as they did many other black leaders in that period, they 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 destroyed it. They they broke it, and then they then they covered all their tracks, right? And that's what that monument is is covering all the tracks. So, anyways, that's that's my sense of how how uh, in the in the sense of what's happened in 150 years ago. That's why we have to remember it is because it's it, they want to cover those tracks. Of the people who were trying to build something that was that was a different kind of North Carolina, a different kind of South. One of the things that happened in the course of our reporting um, is that um, there was also an effort to kind of reclaim white outlaw as a member of law enforcement, and that was um, well, I guess that to some degree preceded our reporting. But Julia went to an event in which. Um, he was actually memorialized. Could you talk about that a little bit, Julia? What were your observations? Sure. Um, there was a, a, a fallen officers event in, I want to say it was in early May um, in Alamance County. And, and there's like, I think it was during National Police Week. And they had had a similar event that is also on the county's uh, YouTube page because they, they uploaded it to their YouTube page when they did the ceremony last year in which they, for the first time um, in 2020, introduced Wyatt Outlaw's name into the Fallen Officers Memorial for Elements County. And um, what's interesting, what a lot of people don't know about Wyatt Outlaw, and maybe Scott could speak more to this because my knowledge of it, why, is very limited, but there aren't any existing photos of him. But if you do a quick Google search, if a photo of another man pops up um, and, in relation to Wyatt Outlaw, and that is the man whose photo is printed um, in a very big frame that is carried and placed into this officer's memorial now for two years in a row. And it's not Wyatt Outlaw. <laughs> it's, it's um, I'm, the man's name is escaping Caswell me right Holt. now. Is it Caswell Holt? It's Caswell Holt. Yes, it's Caswell Holt. It's not Wyatt Outlaw. And for two years in a row now, they have presented it as Wyatt Outlaw in these fallen officers ceremonies. Um, and I also like kind of tangentially like saw a conversation on Instagram going on when the local history museum had put up a new exhibit and they didn't include Wyatt Outlaw in it and people were very upset about that. It just feels like this information is now very much in, in the public sphere and the fact that that's Caswell Holt and not Wyatt Outlaw has been missed on the folks um, bringing these photos to these ceremonies. I don't know if anyone else has, has thoughts on that kind of like the shifting legacy of Wyatt Outlaw. I just want to ask the ask the professor. Holt is one of the one of the leaders of the Klan at that time. What is who is this person that oh, they're showing us? In? Oh, sorry, no, no, no. There's there's multiple Holts, and so um, so Holt is a name of an old planter family, and so there were white Holts and black Holts, and this was a black Holt that was uh, that was that, that the image was of, and he was you know that this um, uh, this man was did know white owl. He actually. Uh, he didn't see the murder, but he, um, he, he shots were fired at him. Um, but the name Holt comes from because he was owned by, you know. Okay, I'm gonna, Holtz. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tap down my outrage now. Then <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Uh, no, he. Uh, but Holt was uh, outlaw. It's difficult to know what he looked like, but he wasn't uh, wasn't as dark as the as the man who who they. Uh, using the image and um, yeah, he had a mustache, I think. And he was, he was sort of, um, yeah, but, but it is a shame that that that's, it's funny because the thing that's perverse about the 150 years later is that 
Wyatt Outlaw was the head of the police, right? He was a town constable. He was the person hold, he was a person holding that town together, right? And and then he was killed. And, and 150 years later, that's not what Alamance looks like, right? That's not what Graham looks like. As I'm sure uh, Ebony can say that that what we see in, in Alamance's policing is in different hands. And people are in danger in part because of the police. So Ebony, maybe you can kind of take us up to the present. Like what are perceptions of law enforcement in Alamance County now? Well, um, first of all, they're, they're not here to protect and serve. They only protect certain people um, just from being in the streets. Uh, the, the, the Confederates, they could get in our face, yell at us, spit at us, put their hands on us. They could do whatever they wanted to. It did not matter. They could say what they wanted to. The police would not bother them. But, you know, as soon as we say anything, we if we say a curse word, all of a sudden, we're wrong, but they have called us the N-word. They've talked about our children. They've done anything, everything they could, standing right there in our face. Matter of fact, that was the first time that I was ever called the N-word to my face by a white person. That was in Graham last year. I mean, I, I, I'd heard it, heard it spewed before, but not directed towards me. I actually had somebody stand in my face, directed towards me with the sheriff standing out there, standing directly beside him, just letting us know that that, that statue wasn't coming down. Matter of fact, he was pointing his finger at us like this, like we were five-year-old children. That statue will not come down in our faces. While they were spewing racist, racial slurs at us, and they did nothing. But if we stepped off the sidewalk, we went to jail. If we didn't move as soon as they told us to, we went to jail. Or we were pepper sprayed. Or our children were, were being top, toppled over by police. Um, where the other side, they could they could stand all over the bricks and hoot and holler and, and outside with alcohol doing whatever they wanted to. And they wouldn't do nothing but protect them. They would protect them every time. We seen one arrest, I think, uh, and they literally took the person around the corner and let them out. What does that make you think, Don? I mean, it's I don't know. It's like you go down there and give it all your energy, and and you go with a positive mind. Like we go out there, and we have those difficult conversations with people that we would never talk to because. We're human beings too. And if you don't like me, I don't like you, but I'm no better than you. I know that we, if we talk to each other, we can coincide with each other and, and be okay. I know this, I've seen it done. So when you go out there with a positive attitude, thinking that things are gonna get better, because if those people are out there, then those are the ones that you can talk to. The people who you can't talk to, they don't come out there. So this is your chance. So now I'm taking my chance to talk to you, even though I know you hate me because of my skin color. We can have good conversations, but then here comes the police who bash. And that's when everything starts to change. It's not the conversations that we had with each other as um, the community. It was when the police got there. It's when they started a certain being mm -hmm. aggressive for no reason, starting stuff, inciting riots, because we would be calm. We might be yelling and fussing, but I mean, it's something that we're all passionate about. They're passionate about their preserving their history, and we're passionate about being part of it. So it, it's like the police is the ones who cause all the problems. So Ebony, I just need to jump in right here because what you're saying right now is so important. And it's something that so many people who are not on the front lines don't understand. Um, here in Raleigh, Emancipatency was one of many other organizations uh, in a coalition called, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry, y'all, it's been a long day. But uh, Raleigh demands justice, Lord have mercy. In a coalition called Raleigh Demands Justice, we where we um, hosted a and, and helped organize a large protest on May 30th in response to George Floyd's murder. Um, my oldest daughter, who was at the time 20, I think, had never been to a full-blown protest like this before. And one of the things that she took away from it was, this is what she said to me when we got back in the car and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Mama, I didn't realize that police started right. 
right? And if you're not out there, you don't know that it is the police that very often are the aggressors, that are the people that antagonize and bring violence and bring hostility to a place that is really there for where, to a place where really we could have a meeting of the minds, where really people could have some real powerful exchanges of ideas. But again, Ebony, cause you girl, you on fire tonight. Again, that doesn't happen by accident. There is absolutely a reason and you nailed it. The reason why law enforcement is used to put this wedge between the two sides, because what they know for sure, what the system knows for sure, is that if these two sides were able to talk, what we would find is that we have much more in common than we have not in common. What we would find is that if we were working together towards a common goal of community safety and advancement and economic support, that we would be so much more powerful. That, my friends, is what they want us to not do. And make no mistake, that is exactly why law enforcement, municipal law enforcement in America was created. It was created not about safety or community. It was created about to maintain social norms. And those social norms were the norms that uphold white supremacy and oppression of black folks and work to advance the stereotypes, the myths, and the misnomers that exist to keep white people and black people or white people and brown people not talking to one another and not having real dialogue. This is what systemic and institutional racism looks like. And this is how it exists. And this is how it shows up in our lives. And law enforcement is being used as a tool to advance those oppressive systems. And we've got to be able to name that and call it when we see it. And Ebony, you you killing it tonight, girl. You're killing it. <laughs> Scott, could you take us back in time a little bit? It seems like we've talked about why, you know, the the death of white outlaw, the killing of white outlaw, um, setting in in motion what followed. Could you kind of um I guess set that up for us. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about what Dawn was saying about maintaining social norms, right? And and so there was a there was a way of policing before the Civil War, and the way of policing was um, the um, basically you you'd call on white people, poor white people, to act as to round people up, right? To to chase after enslaved people that had disappeared. To to um, and so the enforcement of social norms was very informal. It was it was um, uh, you know patrols called the patroller system, and and when people were interviewed, uh, black people were interviewed in the nineteen twenties. They called the Klansmen the patrollers, right? So referring to that old system of social norms, where black people did one thing, white people did another, and and white outlaw tried to break that one hundred and fifty years ago, one hundred and fifty two years, fifty three years ago, by by creating a police force that was the town constables that just enforced the police, just enforced the peace, right? And that they could not stand, that they could not accept, that they, they could not abide by that. And so they broke, they they waited until um, on February 26th, they they came in that midnight and and shot and killed him. Uh, they tried to get Caswell Holt, but they, they went to Outlaw's house first and Holt discovered it and he, he got out and he was able to escape. But, but they were trying to eliminate all the constables, right? Everybody who was part of a system that was not their informal social norms, that was the thing they tried to break and they broke it 100, 152 years ago. And they brought back the slave patrols and they brought back those social norms that, um, you know, that had been briefly extinguished for a few years after the Civil War. And so we don't know about that time because you know, all the effort has been about uh, uh, making that go away. And it, that's the funny thing about the police kind of claiming white outlaw too as a fallen soldier and things, you know, fallen, fallen officer or something like that. Because the kind of police that he represented was a police that was really about law and order, that was really about protecting everyone in that community. And that police is gone and it's been gone for 152 years in Alamance County. 
Uh, and I just very, very quickly, because um, there was so much that I wanted to add in this conversation, but I most importantly want to say that today in Raleigh, House Bill 805 passed um, mostly along party lines, the House, um, and that is an, the, an anti-Black Lives Matter, anti-riot protest bill, right? It is on its way now to Governor Cooper's desk, and it is imperative that everyone on this call call Cooper and tell him to veto this terrible piece of legislation. And not only do I want you to call and tell him to veto, I want you to tell three other people to call and tell him to veto. Because again, this is what institutional racism looks like. And this is how it becomes part of our systems. When you create laws that on their face look as though they are race neutral, but based on what Ebony is telling us about what is happening in Graham County is that she is being called racial slaughter they are being um, the Black Lives Matter protesters are who are who are being peaceful, who are being um, who are protesting and exercising their constitutional right to protest are being treated as though they are innately criminal, whereas those folks who are actually displaying hateful criminal behavior are being given a pass. Like in the video that, like in the, the documentary that was produced where the Black Lives Matter protesters, one of whom was, I remember just trying to go across the street and get uh, food, uh, was treated so roughly. And a, a white protester was arrested, not dragged up the steps of the courthouse, but taken into a restaurant, a place that was much less uh, much less confrontational, much less uh, stigmatizing as it relates to, to being justice involved. This is why bills like these that are birthed out of racism, no matter what they want to say, and no matter how race neutral the language is, this is why we have to stop these types of legislations from more deeply embedding racism and bias into our systems. And last thing, I'm sorry, I know I said I was quick and I lied. Uh, we need for people that don't look like Ebony and I to say that, right? We need for you, because until white folks decide that this system is egregious, that this system is one that is unworthy to be called American, right? And they turn on it and demand change, not just because they have skin in, in the game, but because it is the right thing to do. Until that happens, Ebony and I will continue to be in the streets and yelling and screaming and protesting and demanding our humanity be recognized. But the people that are out there who have the power to recognize our humanity don't care what we think. They care what you think. One of the things that I thought was um, particularly powerful witnessing what happened in Graham over the last year was that there was kind of a physical embodiment of, of some of what you're talking about, Dawn, of it was, we were talking about the physical public square and access to it and equal representation within it whether that was through monuments or um, just physical presence. Um, I know that um, there, have, there has been other legislation as well that sort of touches on some of, some of the issues that came up in Graham and in other cities um, post George Floyd. In the bill that you're talking about, there was an effort to make, um, to increase the penalties for being present at what is deemed a riot um, and so those, those, those sort of definitions were in flux and um, expanded. There was another bill that I thought was um, interesting that came up uh, a few months ago that was proposed by Senator Amy Gailey, who was the um, chair of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. And that bill related to disruptions at public meetings. Um, Julie, I don't know if you want to describe the public meeting that we went to um, where, where folks were trying um, to get in and, and sort of what your observations were of that. 
Sure. Yeah. And, and Ebony was there as well. Um, I, I can't remember if you came inside Ebony, but I know you were outside the courthouse that night as well. Okay. You did come in as well. Yeah. So um, I'd also like to hear your take on it because mine was very much focused through the camera. But um, what I saw was a, a, a board of commissioners that was um, threatened by uh, the presence of activists in their public meeting. And it was the first I believe it was their first opportunity to make public comment in person after what happened on October 31st. And um, almost immediately upon uh, people entering in order to settle down and into the room and wait for the public comment section, um, there was an altercation over where to sit because of social distancing. And um, several officers in not riot gear, but in full vests came out from, um, wherever they were, and uh, kind of postured at everyone. And then I left the room and and some some uh, pretty awful arrests happened after that um, on and the Alamance County Sheriff's Office do not wear body cameras. So we could not see those arrests in full after the fact. But Ebony, what was your experience like that night? Um, So I I think we had had a a little press conference on the steps before we were there. Or we talked or something like that, if I'm recalling it correctly. And then um, several of us uh, started to try to go in. Uh, we had certain stuff on us that said we can't bring that in. We can't bring that in. So they were already harassing us, trying to deter us from coming in. So once we got in, we went upstairs. And when we walked through the door, everybody in the whole room stopped talking. Um, uh, I can't remember who was speaking at the time at the podium, but... He looked like he's seen several ghosts. Um, everybody turned around and started looking at us. And we were just, we made our way to our seats. And we were the first group in, I believe. So we were super duper quiet. But downstairs, we could hear a lot of ruckus. Um, not quite sure what it was, but it was to the point where we got up and started down the stairs to calm them down because we didn't know exactly what was going on. Uh, Eventually that crowd made it upstairs and that's when the arrest started. So I didn't get to see that myself, but I just know just to go in there and sit down and be quiet. um, They let us know we weren't welcome. There were, you can, you can tell the conversation changes every time we step in the room. So that was one of those things where they kind of stopped looking at their paper and started looking at us and the meeting is not for us. So read your paper. But they stopped. The whole you could tell the whole conversation changed when we got in the room. I mean, what one of the things that that makes me think about is this question of sort of like uh, what is real and how video has come to def- help us define what is real. And we're now um, some of the reporting that we've done since the story published is about gaining access to law enforcement um, video. And we've had a difficult time doing that. There have been a lot of issues related to um, law enforcement agencies having video to start with. As Julia pointed out, the sheriff's office, um, well, they actually said in um, a court hearing that they would never have body camera um, footage. That was what one of the attorneys said. Um, Grand police do have body cameras, but that has not in every case been turned over to the district attorney or um, in some cases to the judge when there is a petition for, for um, that footage, which is required in North Carolina. Under North Carolina law, you have to petition a judge in order to see that um, footage in many cases, unless you are requesting as somebody who's represented in the footage itself. And that's another thing that's also being debated in the legislature right now. So at, like in conclusion, I would love to hear you all talk about kind of how in this moment now we move forward to um, to define kind of um, like what's real, like how, do, how does this get back in the public square, in the public debate in a way that's productive or possible? I'll jump in real quick. Um, so first I'd like to say it's kind of weird and it's hard to approach anything. Uh, if I didn't know you and I seen you in the store, like I'm a really happy person. I speak to everybody. I don't know if I can speak to you. And I feel like I see other white people looking at me like I want to speak to her and they don't know if they can speak to me. So um, I don't know. I guess the way it's just been 
place between us as black and white people right now. We're going to have to have those difficult conversations and pull that wedge back out because before it wasn't necessarily there, but now we've had to face reality and we have to just deal with it. So we've got to be able to talk to each other without the politicians and everything else. And it's just community members and get it back on track because it sucks not knowing whether it's okay to be your neighbor's friend or not. That's beautiful, Ebony. And I think also, but again, like I said, Ebony is batting a thousand tonight, y'all. Because really, this is about reimagining what it means and how we change systems, how we dismantle systems. What we have to do is give ourselves permission to think outside the box about the way that we interact with one another, about the way we talk to one another and about the way we relate to one another. OK, um, and when we do that, when we don't allow these racist systems to dictate how we communicate with one another, how we interact with one another, then we get to the place where Ebony is talking about, where we can have these real genuine conversations, where we can listen, where we are we are not so deeply bogged down into um, ideological tribalism and are more interested in talking about our day-to-day -day lives. Because let me be real, most of racism is a, <laughs> is, a, is a terrible, terrible mechanism to help control capitalism and help control capital, right? So what we have to remember, especially now in a time of COVID where poor people I don't care what you look like. Poor people are catching it right now and will continue to catch it. And the one thing that they don't want is poor people talking to one another, right? Because if we were, if, if they keep us focused on who lives next door to us and what kind of stupid Confederate flag we hang in, none of us are paying attention to the fact that all of our poor behinds are getting evicted, right? And that's what they want. So we it, we have to we have to uh, untether ourselves from tr traditional systems of interaction, untether ourselves and our thoughts and our minds from parties, from political parties, from you know identities and things of that nature, and really think about what makes us more alike than not alike. And when we do that, that is a powerful thing. I tell you what, though, you be careful because that's what got Fred Hampton killed in Chicago, right? Was bringing together people who had common goals and seeing beyond the artificial barriers that are created to advance economic, to advance capitalism in America. That's what we got to do. That's the next step. That's uh, I, I, I just wanted, I, the, I was thinking about the public square, Albion Turge, who is a friend of White Atlas, a white, white friend of White Atlas who wrote novels uh, and, and put, put Outlaw in the novels. He said that the biggest problem in the South is that there aren't um, town meetings, the town hall meetings that you see in New England and, and the Midwest, you don't see them in the South. He said, without town meetings, there's, there's no dialogue. And so that Ebony walking in with other with other black people right in that town meeting and everyone shutting up all of a sudden because this is not for them that's that speaks to exactly this problem that that we need a kind of town meeting right and that's what that square is about that's why that square is there uh, putting up a fence around it a, around the confederate monument is just breaking up that public and we need a public we need a public place where we can we can hash these things out and and not have provocateurs, which is frankly what the police were in this case. They were Asian provocateurs. They were there to make trouble so they could, you know, beat in heads and stop it. And so seizing the public square and to, and making it a place where people talk to each other is is I think the thing that's missing in this in the South. And and that's that's where the healing is going to be. And I and I think town meetings, part of it is just showing up. At those town meetings, and and just recognizing this, just not for those people. It's it's for it's for all of us. They they they're there to represent us. And if there's not enough space there, that's their problem. 
Right. And, and the reason there isn't enough space is intentional, y'all. Um, I do want to uh, also just uplift as we talk about coming together and having these community dialogues outside of the, the norms that are created for us. Um, I am actually involved very deeply right now in a in some litigation that's going on in Alamance uh, around where um, where some black women who were participating and who ha ha were courageous enough to speak up and speak out against a person who um, who they believe said some really horrible things and is in a position where she is being trusted with the lives of folks, right? They spoke up and spoke out against her. And this person is using the Alamance legal system and the innate racism that is baked into it to bring a defamation lawsuit against these black women and using your legal system to terrorize them and to make them fearful and to bully them. So I'm gonna ask you all to come out the week of October 4th to that Confederate statue that stands on literally on the courts of where justice is supposed to be doled out and start having those conversations. Y'all come every day the week of October 4th and have conversations with one another about the way that Alamance County is using your legal system to further racism, to further hatred, but most importantly, to silence the voice of the people. October 4th, y'all, I hope uh, the week of October 4th, we hope to see y'all out there having these good conversations. Let's um, expand our questions to the audience and see um, see how we can, in this most immediate sense, expand those. Yeah. yeah, thank you all for the very lively discussion and for uh, the robust number of questions submitted. Um, we'll try and get to a few here. Uh, so I want to start off, like a lot of you were talking about uh, the importance of finding common ground um, and that as a starting place. And what, you know, one, one person asked like, if there are any instances of that happening, like while you were out protesting or just in the course of your work where, you know, you did find um, some common ground to, uh, to connect with other people. I'll jump in. Um, absolutely. Um, there, we, we, we've had a lot of hugging outs. Uh, we, we've sat down and talked to some people who necessarily went and talked to us. Uh, and we made a lot of ground way with them and just came to a conclusion that we all want to protect who we are. We all want to know who we are. And when you don't know who that is, it does make you angry and you do get out of character. And so we have made friends and people that we keep in contact with that was on the other side and they're, they're working on their family. And I'm working on my family because that's how it's got to work. We got to pass it on. So it has been some good conversations coming out of it. Um, and then another, uh, this sounds like it came from a, a resident of Alamance County who's asking, you know, this is an engaged person who maybe has limited time, but they're wondering like, you know, how they can, uh, you know, best spend their energy and time to, you know, support the causes you all are advocating for. And like, you know, how might you, uh, suggest they, uh, you know, mobilize their time and resources. I guess that's me again. Um, Honestly, um, I have kind of pulled back from protesting myself. What I do is build a community. Um, we we have these community events where we go to some of the poor areas and we might have a cookout. Um, uh, depending on what is going on at the time, if it was getting vaccinated or whatever, we just basically we build rapport and then whatever we have available that we can help build these communities up, we present that to them because otherwise they may not get that. So you might not want to protest. It's not everybody. Everybody doesn't want their face out there. Um, but there's just several things to do within the community. Um, uh, is uh, different different organizations that I always donate to. We always need water and stuff for protest and different things of the sort. So. It's a lot. You don't have to be on Fort Street. Mm -hmm. What are the names of the organizations in Graham? 
Um, there are several. Um, you do have Occupy Grand. They have um, food boxes in different areas. Um, they have one on Washington Street. They, want, they have one at the Muse, in front of the Muse in Grand. Uh, you can donate um, non-perishable goods there. You can also go in the Muse and um, donate directly to um, Dion. She's the owner there. And anything that you donate to her definitely gets out to the protesters and to the community or wherever it needs to go. So that's like a great spot to go to if you want to donate. And also, y'all, the most powerful thing you can do is use your personal influence within your sphere of influence, right? You don't have to do some grandiose gesture. The most important thing you can do is have these difficult conversations with the people in your lives, with your coworkers, with your friends, with the people that you go to church with and help them to challenge some of the things that they believe to be true. Help them challenge and break up some of those norms. That is the most powerful thing that any of you can do is talk to your own people, talk to people around you and help influence people around you. I tell folks all the time, I can do lots of protests and blah, 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 and lawyering and all that good stuff. But the most important thing I will ever do is raise two daughters into adult women who believe that a better world exists. That is the most important thing you do. Create better people for the world. You do that by talking to folks. Um, here's a question uh, for uh, the journalists. So what was what was one of the most difficult parts um, of the reporting process for this story? And then uh, someone also asked to Julia specifically, like as a visual journalist, what did you feel was most Im uh, important to include in the, in the visual telling of this story? I'll answer that one quickly and then I'll pass the other one off to Carly. Um, I think one of the most important things to, to include in visual coverage of, of a story like this is as many sources of video as you can find and get permission to use. Um, I watched lots of Ebony's Facebook Live videos and other people who I became friends with on Facebook over time. Um, I think that being there a lot of the time and, and talking to people and putting our faces in front of people so that they knew who we were was incredibly important for both parts of the reporting. But piecing together different perspectives of things that we were trying to report and prove a point with um, about what was actually going on there and the truth there, I think is one of the most important parts of visual coverage. I think the answer is quite similar for me, um, although um, it, it was clear to us sort of early on that to tell this story uh, completely and with as much like fidelity to reality as we could, we needed um, the, the trust of people on the ground protesting and that did require being there a lot and listening a lot. Um, it also required building trust and listening to people who were counter protesting. And um, that, was, that was hard to find access points, right? To be able to represent that perspective um, in a way that they would recognize it all, which was I think important for the credibility of the story. That, that also took a lot of time and a lot of background research. I mean, there's so many interviews <laughs> that are not in this, um, in not represented in the, the story itself, just like hundreds of people in the community to understand a small town that doesn't necessarily um, like outsiders always, or to be um, portrayed by outsiders. And, you know, we took that seriously. And then the third component was this law enforcement component, which also had felt misrepresented by the News and Observer and other media outlets in the past. Um, so that was really the hardest thing was building trust. And a lot of the solution to that was an incredible investment of time to try to really understand. Yeah, great. Um, well, that's our time for today. Uh, I just want to, again, thank our panelists. Uh, you all were great for this excellent conversation um, and our moderator, Carly Brousseau. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. Um, again, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email tomorrow with the full recording of today's video. Um, we will also post this on our YouTube channel so you can share it with friends who might not have made it. From all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. We'll see you next time.